Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. Last time we were looking at matter arising in the creation story, and we've been looking at some mysteries that are actually involved, embedded in this you know creation story and we look at the fact that there are other creation story in other tradition we've looked at that we have looked at man and animal the continuity and the discontinuity we have looked at the issue of where was the earth dark and formless and void in genesis chapter 1 verse 1 why was the creation done in seven days god could have done it in, in in one day in two days six days he created the last day he rested. We look at the gender, the sexes of, of humanity. Why did God decide to create man first and then pull the woman out of the man? We have looked at that. So if you are not here the last time, please go back. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay, and we have seen very, very clearly that the creation of man was the, or the creation of humanity, the creation of the man and the woman was the high point of the creation story. It was the crescendo of the creation story. When you read the creation story, you will see that everything in that story was building up to this point in the story. Unlike a whole lot of the other creation story from other tradition and myth of the pagan world, the creation of man was not an accident. In fact, the story is was jarring towards this. This was the high point. Everything was building up to this point when God was going to create this humanity on earth. And humanity, the man and the woman, they were God's masterpiece. Everything was going up to this point. The question is, what set humanity apart? What set humanity apart? from other animals it was this fact that man was created in the image of god and that is what we want to be dealing with what exactly does it mean that humanity that the man and the woman were created in the mere image of god in this story in this unfolding story in this god story in this god's you know epic story that we've been going through this point is really very important what god has been doing up till now and what god is doing now in creating this man and this woman is so important what set the man apart from every other creature from the animal is the fact that man was created in the image of god god himself wrote his signature and imprint in the human soul his own signature his own imprint God put his own imprint in human soul. God put his own signature in human soul. And that is one of the things we want to start looking at today. So, man as the image of God. And this is what is called in, in Latin, imago Dei. Man in the image of God. The fact that man is the image of God, that is what we call imago Dei. That this man, this woman, this humanity that God created, they were created in God's image. The question is, what does this actually mean? And what is the implication and what is the application of the fact that man and woman, that humanity was created in the image of God? Why is this important? So when you read the Old Testament, you will see that there are only three explicit reference to man being the image of God. And all these three references are in this section of the Bible, the Genesis chapter 1, verse, the Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11. And this portion of the scripture actually prefixes the whole Bible. This is the foundation 
of the story of the whole Bible. So Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 11. This is actually the micro story. This is the meta narrative of creation. This is the meta narrative of the redemptive story. This is the microcosm of the story of the whole Bible. Genesis is the beginning, is the foundation, is the laid the foundation upon which this whole story is going to be built. So if man was created in the image of God and after his likeness, then it's important for us to know and to understand what was the revelation, what was the what was the what was the model, what was the portrait of God that is given to us in this first few chapter of the book of Genesis? This chapter that actually laid the foundation for us for every other thing that we are going to read in the Bible. So I'm going to go over that again. So three explicit reference to man being created in the image of God and all of them are in this section of the Bible. Now the theologians have names. They, they call this the primeval story, but this is the foundation story. This is the microcosm. This is the this is the meta narrative. This is the micro story. This is the meta narrative of the other story. This this is the story within the story. This is the foundation. If we get it wrong here, we'll get it wrong in every part of the story. But if we get it right here, then we will probably get it right moving these things forward. So we are going to look at all those three sections. We are man was uh, clearly and explicitly uh, referenced as being the image of God. So we've read the first one in Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 to 28. So we've read that one, so I'm not going to read that again. The second one is in Genesis chapter 5 verse 1. This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created man, humanity, in the likeness of God made he him. And the third one is Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. Whoso shedded man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. And twice in the New Testament, it definitely also referenced human creation in God's image. That is, that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 7, and it also referenced in the book of James. But there are other places in the New Testament that actually reference God's image. But it is often related to Christ. And this is very, very important today. Remember, in the Old Testament, it was about humanity in the first 11 chapter of Genesis. But the most, most time in the New Testament, when the New Testament referenced the image of God, it was oftentimes related more to Christ as the ultimate, as the ultimate image of God. And sometimes it's also referenced in the redemptive renewal of the image of God in the church. The question is, why is that so? Why is that so that we only have these three references in the first 11 chapter of the book of Genesis, and then it is repeated and revisited for us in the New Testament, and in the New Testament, it is much more related to the Christ. We are going to revisit, we are going to come back to look at that, but... but enough to say that here it was because that image was broken that image the man was created the woman was created humanity was created in the image of god but that image was broken and the redeemer who is the perfect image of the invisible god he came to restore that broken image so that image is almost like if you have a beautiful plate but breakable plate a beautiful verse but pre you know, breakable verse. If it drops and it broke, that is the end of it. Something happened to that image in the book of Genesis. It broke. Now, it didn't disappear. It was broken. It was defaced. But we thank God because God didn't leave it alone at that. The perfect image of the invisible God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, came in the New Testament. He came to restore that broken image of God in man. So today we are going to look at that ultimate image image of God, which is the Christ himself. Let's read a couple of scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we are going to read just the second part. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4b, Christ who is the image of God. You can see over there, Christ is the image of God. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, talking about Christ, who being the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of his person. Then let's read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 23. Here he's talking about that image being restored in the church and put on the new nature, the regenerated self created in God's image, God-like 
in true righteousness and holiness. And 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, But we all are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So I've read two sets of scripture for us. The first two actually tells us about that image, that image of God that is being related to Christ, who is the perfect, ultimate image of God. And then in the second part, we begin to see how that image also is being applied to the renewal of the image of God in the church. So we 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 are we are looking at the beginning and then we are going to Christ because the image was man the man and the woman humanity were created in the image of God, but something desperately went wrong with that image. And the Christ came in the New Testament to restore that image. That reminds me of a very important incident or story that we read in the Bible. And I'm going to read this in Luke chapter 20, verse 21. This was the story when the leaders, when the chief priest and the scribe under Tiberius Caesar, when they came and they wanted to catch the Lord Jesus Christ, they want to catch him out. They wanted to, you know, to get him into trouble, essentially. So they came and they tried to ask him. A question obviously they ask him a lot of tricky questions but this one I want us to read this today so let's look at Luke chapter 20 verses 21 to 25 and they ask him that is the chief priests and the scribe and they ask him saying master we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly neither acceptest thou the person of any but teachest the way of God truly verse 22 this is their question is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar, and the Caesar there is Tiberius Caesar? Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? Obviously, this was a trick question. This was a trick question they were trying to catch him. Head you lose, tail you lose. It's not going to win this. If it says don't pay tribute to Caesar, it will be in trouble with the government. If it says pay tribute to Caesar, the people will turn against him. So they knew what they were doing. They were trying to trap him. With this question but verse 23 tells us that the lord jesus realized what they were doing verse 23 but he lord jesus christ per perceived their craftiness said unto them they were crafty they were not honest they were trying to manipulate him but he did something that is very relevant to what we are doing today verse 23 again but when he perceived their craftiness he said unto them why tempt you me verse 24 which is where we are going today show me a penny whose image and superscription had it. And that is important to what we are dealing with today. Whose image, show me a penny, the Lord Jesus said. Whose image and whose superscription had it? They answer and said, Caesar's. And the Lord Jesus said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God. Wow. There's a whole lot of things that we can talk about in that place, but we want to focus on the issue of Caesar. So the Lord Jesus said, okay, remember this was a trap, this was a trick, they are trying to tempt him. But he said, give me, give me a penny. Now, Roman penny has an image upon it, the form of a man's head that is struck, that is imprinted, that is, you know, you know imprinted as it were. On the penny, and oftentimes it tend to be the head of the emperor. So Roman penny usually have that much, much like most of our penny or our coin today. There's a superscription, you know, it's imprinted upon that, you know, that that penny or that coin. And then round about the in, in, inscription or round about that image will be inscription or writing showing whose head is on that coin and whose money it was and when it was coined pretty much like what we do today okay essentially the image of the of caesar in this particular case the image of tiberius caesar on that coin shows that the money belongs to tiberius caesar because his image is on it now this is very important his image is on that coin and because his image is on that coin that coin belongs to him it is he whose image is on the coin that owns the coin and this is very very important and the lord jesus is going to turn this around and is going to actually take it to a new realm they wanted to trap him but he trapped the trap master as it were praise the lord he was telling them look 
this is the coin this is the coin you use to pay tax isn't it whose image is on it whosoever image is on this coin that coins belong to him and he was going to turn around and said whose image is on you because you are like that coin humanity is like this coin whose image do we bear and whosoever whoever image we bear to him we belong humanity was created in the image of god humanity bears god image whatever that image is will come to that in consequent teaching by the grace of God, that if you and I bear the image of God, then we belong to God. Indeed, we bear the image of God, and therefore we belong to God. Even the unbeliever, we will see in other teaching that even the unbeliever bears God's image. Yes, that image may be defaced, just like you can have a coin that has been, you know, gone through rough time, it's been scratched, it's been defaced, or you can even have you know, a paper note that has been scrambled, that has been, you know, maybe painted over, maybe has been, that there, are, there are all sort of stain on it, but that money still bears the image of that country. That money is still a money. It may be a scrambled, scrambled rumbled, defaced coin, but still a coin that belongs to that nation. You know, our value is not because of the color of our skin. Our value is not because of our gender. Our value is not because of the class that we belong to. We are valuable because we are created in the image of God. Male and female created he them. We are created in the image of God. And that is what gives us value. And it is the fact that humanity down history has ignored this fact that has made one one group of people to actually afflict and destroy and kill other group of people or make one gender to you know manipulate and to intimidate and to afflict other gender or one class to take advantage of another class when we understand that actually our value is because each and every one of us are created in the image of God, no matter which part of the of the world we came from, no matter the color of our skin, we are created in the image of God. That is why images of, of on coins were not approved by the Jews. There come Tetrarch Philip, and he was the one that started putting the image of Caesar on strictly Jewish coin. But the Lord Jesus was bringing was taking them back to the beginning which is where we are at the moment to say listen this coin belongs to caesar because the image of caesar is on it but you belong to god because the image of god is on you there's an ancient quote which i'm going to read out he said a king whose coin is current in any country the inhabitant of that country agree about him and it is their joint opinion that he is their Lord and they are his master. This is very important. And particularly, we can extend this to the end of the world when the Antichrist is going to control commerce. Okay, when Antichrist is going to control the flow of currency. So the king whose coin is current, the king who's, who controls the currency, the king whose image is on the currency. And this is why when people... Start talking about a nation or when there's an amalgamation on nation one of the things they want to do is for all of them to have the same currency so there's an ancient saying that says that if a king have his head is burst his head is image of, of the currency and the inhabitant of that country are spending that currency actually that is a, a demonstration of the fact that they accept that king as their lord as the subject and the husbandman of god the you hold him service and the you hold him worship and the you hold him their life. And God, he was actually using that as an occasion to teach them to say, listen, you are created in the image of God. Obedience, he was saying, the fact that you give, you give tax to Caesar does not necessarily clash with your obedience to God. But where there is a clash, where obedience to God 
clashes with obedience to Caesar, then we have to obey God because the image of God is imprinted in our soul. The image of God is imprinted in our soul because the signature of God is in the soul of every human being now. In some of them, it has been bastardized. It has been, it, it has been weakened. It has been, you know, defaced. And remember, that is why that, that, that Savior is going to come so that he can restore that image. But the image of God is in every humanity. And understand that that baby in that womb also is the image of God. And to kill that baby in that womb is to destroy God's image. Okay, the image of God is in that baby, in that womb. And that is very, very important. And every man and every woman bears God's image. And we are going to look at some of those things as we go on. Praise the Lord. I think I'm going to stop here today. We are gradually looking into this very important junction that we have been talking about the image of God. We saw God in the beginning, Elohim created bara the heavens and the earth and we saw him create in a series of six days okay and we're going to talk about some of those things again because you are going to see that there's a reason for this but we've mentioned it that when you read the the, the scripture in genesis you will see that all those creation actually they were moving up to this crescendo they were moving up to this to this crescendo to this creation of this man this woman this humanity who is God's masterpiece? And God created them in his own image. And we are looking at the significance, the implication and the application of the fact that humanity was created in the image of God. And if you are listening to me today, listen to me. You are created in God's image. But something has gone totally wrong with that image. Sin defaced. That image is just like a car that has an accident or a human being that has been, you know, involved in an accident and have bones broken and bruises and that needs to be repaired. That needs to be treated. But in this particular case, we were so defaced that we could not be repaired. You remember sometimes when a car has an accident in the Western world, the insurance can come and say, look, this is not repairable. We need to replace it. You see, that image in us has been so bastardized that it needed replacement. And that is why the creator came himself as the redeemer so that he can do a new work. He can take the whole heart out of us and give us a new heart. Give us a restored image, a, the image of God restored in our heart so that we can then have fellowship with him. We can become a member of his family. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, so that whosoever believe in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You need to come to him, confess your sin, confess your need of a savior, of a redeemer, invite him, receive that gift of salvation from his hand. He will come in, he will save you, he will be your father, your friend, throughout the rest of your journey on this earth. And when this is all over, you will spend eternity with him, in the new heaven and the new heart.